Hey, let's pray together. Lord, we know that you are with us. We thank you that you have kept your promises to us. You feel, fulfilled your promise in sending Jesus. And Lord, we, we believe. Help us today uh, with our unbelief. Help us to trust you more, to believe more deeply what you've already accomplished for us on the cross and through your perfect life, live for us. Lord, we we believe that you are with us. By faith, we step into, we, we see through the portal of your kingdom's work and with spiritual eyes, we know that your presence is here with us. Your promised spirit is here with us. And so we, we worship you now and we know that you speak into our hearts. And so we listen by your spirit, Lord. I pray that you'll speak and use this time as we open your word. Change us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, it is great again to see you today. I'm so glad that you're here. I hope you'll come every Sunday as we move towards Christmas Eve. We're going to be together first time in a couple of years. And all of you watching online, we're grateful. You have a place here as well. But I hope you'll grab your Bible. In fact, you can grab your Bible now and you can turn to Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. We'll get there in a moment. Uh, I want everyone to turn in the Bible. That's, of course, the text for this course, always, all right? Again, way to go, church family. Had a great Thanksgiving morning, uh, an incredible time at, at Jack Lowe. I was down at Cornerstone as well. Chris Simmons, pastor there, sends his love to us all to say thank you. Thank you for helping serve the homeless there, something that we do throughout the year. Really, uh, Nancy Rockwell, you know, Larry Richardson, others really involved there, helping make it happen. Incredible ministry in South Dallas there that we're a part of. And so, man, I love this time of year. I love the serving of others. I love uh, the music. I love the lights. I almost love the shopping. Um, but I love, I love the movies. Um, I, you know, Hallmark movies, I don't know, uh, are too predictable for me. I like the old classics. Um, it's a Wonderful Life, probably my favorite one, right? Uh, Miracle on 34th Street is, is great, as is a White Christmas. Kind of makes me giggle, but that's a good one as well. And then some of the newer classics, um, which are a little different. Home Alone, anybody seen this? Uh, Elf is outstanding. And then Christmas Vacation. If you've not seen Clark Griswold um, trying to get his lights up, there's a sequence in that film, which is basically what the movie's about, waiting on him to get the lights on to turn the lights on. If you haven't seen it, he's, he's you know, about to kill himself, uh, trying to make it happen, and he's got lights all over uh, his house, and he's having a hard time getting them lit. And the whole family's waiting. His dysfunctional family is there, not unlike you know, some, some of our Christmases, but he's out there working hard, and it's snowing, or it has snowed, and um, they don't know that there's this switch right by a, a whole bunch of uh, plugs that he's put into like one socket right and it's got extensions all over you know it's about to blow up something and there's a switch right there I think his mother-in-law um, his, his wife keeps switching not knowing that every time it's shutting everything down finally uh, the lights come on with him out there for a moment shutting down like the entire city like the whole grid shuts down but then back up and in the iconic moment he comes together sparks fly the lights come on and then the soundtrack kicks into the hallelujah chorus. I mean, it's just amazing. And for a moment, the family comes out, looks at it. Clark's beside himself. And then, just like that, they just walk back inside. And that's Christmas. That's about as good as it gets. Right there. Clark has a moment. Now, I hope your preparations for Christmas go a little better than his. But if we're not careful, we'll do exactly what Clark did. We'll get hyper-focused on things that do not matter. We'll, we'll give all of our anxious thoughts and activity to things that are not central. And we too will miss Christmas altogether. And we'll just put up with, you know, cousin Eddie or, you know, the crazy uncle, whoever you might have coming around. You're going to just, you know, deal with that as best you can. Love, yes, lots of grace. But if you're not careful, you're going to miss it. And that's why we're here today. And that's why we as a church family have come together to say, let's not let it happen. 
And if you live outside of town, you can even join us. You can grab, I mentioned it earlier, you can grab this uh, Advent guide. This is the most important overall thing I want to say today, apart from, from the gospel that's going to come clear for us all here in a moment, if you haven't seen it already. But this is for our entire church family and friends, watch this, to walk every single day. Not simply to show up on a Sunday and sing carols and, and have a wonderful time, by the way, which is key, but for us to walk daily. Walk every single day, coming before the Lord as we talk about awaiting his promise today. We're going to talk about awaiting uh, his rescue next week and then awaiting his presence and then awaiting uh, his return. Because if we're not careful, we're going to miss it. Uh, we don't wait too well. Uh, we, we want to take things in our own hands, try to turn the lights on ourselves. And we too can be bumbling and stumbling around like Clark Griswold. But it's not just Christmas. Our kids are waiting, aren't they? Excited for Christmas to come. I remember as a kid um, waiting uh, for Christmas Eve to get here. My sweet mom is here today, by the way. I had to point that out. She's right over here. And I'm so grateful for mom to be here with us. Yes. Um, yay. Thank you, mom. Thanks for giving birth to me. Uh, yay. I'm glad. No, I'm so glad mom is here, not always able to be here uh, as she lives in North Carolina. But I say that because I'm remembering all these great, uh, wonderful memories uh, of Christmas, waiting as a child. But even when we grow up, we don't wait too well, do we? Do you ever feel like all that Christmas promises, the hope, the joy, the peace, all that Christmas promises may never come? I mean, let's be honest. Some of us are walking through maybe some of the hardest moments of our lives right now. And Christmas tends to make that, our, our pain, our, our challenges more acute because everybody else is happy, seemingly, right? We don't wait well when all of life is waiting. We wait for that perfect job to come along and it never seems to come. We, we, we wait as young people to grow up and then we enter into adulting, which really gets hard. We wait in our singleness, perhaps, for someone to fill maybe a void that we have, and then we wait in marriage for our spouse to become that person. And they never quite do. We wait. But we don't wait well. We, we force our way in. We push our way in front of people. We're impatient. We're waiting on others to get on board with our agenda. We take control, hoping that by our good works, our great effort, the lights will come on. But today, I want us to talk about how we wait, awaiting the promise that is to come. If it's true that all of life is waiting, we've got to get this right. You see, Christians wait differently. Waiting is not passive for the believer. We don't push ourselves into it, but we wait actively. We wait according to God's promise and what he's told us to do. Because we know that a sovereign God is going to come through on his promises. So how do we wait? Today we're going to see we wait patiently, we wait purposefully, and we wait peacefully. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 9. If you're not yet in Isaiah, go ahead and turn there. Isaiah chapter 9. I want us to put this in context before I dive in. So hang with me. We're going to exegete a passage. We're going to then apply it at the end. All right. So I want to put this in context. And I'm talking about not just in context of Isaiah. I want to get there. I'm talking about the big picture. Because what happens too often, we've truncated the gospel. We, we've, we've cut it off. We've limited it. Many people believe that, well, the gospel, the good news of Jesus is that he came, uh, Christmas, so he came, we can celebrate that. Then he died on the cross for my sin, so Easter. And uh, if I just believe that or somehow receive it, I go to heaven. When I die, that's the gospel. And that's not the gospel. The gospel begins, the good news has to begin at the beginning. God created us and all things he created, he created good. He created Adam and Eve. He created us male and female. And then the snake is presented early on in chapter 3 of Genesis. He's presented as the one who's rebelled against God and he's, he's then tempting everyone else to rebel with him. Adam and Eve, who represent us, fall into sin. And they turn away from God, right? And, and, and then it says in chapter 3 of Genesis, we're three chapters into the story here, 
And it says that a son, someone will come. A son of Eve will come. And this someone will enter into this kind of epic battle with the serpent. The serpent will actually strike him on the heel. It seems as if they knock each other out. But then there's this promise of one who's to come. And throughout the Old Testament, there's those who show up. We wonder even early on, is it Noah? Well, he, he's a type of rescue, but he's not the one. He's just a mortal man. We, then Abraham comes. He's given a promise, but he's not the promise. And, nor is Moses. Moses shows up and God, you, David comes. He's another type of the promise, but he's not. He's just a fallible man. It says that he dies and he's buried with his fathers. And then his son Solomon comes along. In no time, there's a divided kingdom. He's not the man. We keep waiting and waiting. But there's one prophet who shows up, among many, pointing to the coming Messiah. And this one, Isaiah, starts to bring clarity to the vision and he starts to help us, though the language is still, still challenging because we're talking about the spiritual realm. We're talking about the work of God and his king that is to come. Judah and Israel are now, in this passage, there's a divided kingdom. You know the history here. Isaiah is warning King Ahaz, who's the king of Judah, the southern uh, kingdom, in Jerusalem, that God's judgment is going to come. And it's going to come by the way of Assyria and Babylon. The great empire in this moment is the Assyrian empire. And they're going to come like a refining fire upon God's people. I've said it in recent days. I believe God is refining his church in America right now. And we see it here. He does this throughout. In chapter 6, you might know this passage. We use it as a model for worship often. He enters in, Isaiah enters into the sanctuary, the presence of God there. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He sees the vision of the angels and he sees this burning coal coming to his mouth. He's afraid he's going to die. When in reality, it hits him and it actually purifies him. God tells him that Israel's going to be cut down. Listen to this. Cut down like a stump. Interesting image. Cut down like a stump, then burned. But out of that burning, smoldering stump comes a seed. A seed within that kind of judgment and destruction because God's judgment is not the final word. And then in, in, in verses or chapter 7 through 9, a couple of children are presented. Again, placing all this in context, the historical issue here is two northern kingdoms um, or neighbors of Judah, it'd be Israel, and, 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 and then you got Syria. Uh, they're coming down on Judah. So King Ahaz makes a king's ransom to Assyria. They want to partner with him, but he says, no, I can't do this. He's afraid of Assyria coming down. And, and then, then uh, what happens is Isaiah has a son, and his name is to be Shir Jashub. Shir Jashub. Now, by the way, on Thanksgiving afternoon, we had a gender reveal. Many of you know that my daughter Whitney is, is pregnant with child this Christmas season, and we're going to have a son. We're going to have a grandson. And I need to tell her, Shir Jashub. It's a good name. It's a good name. <laughs> um, it, no, it means literally, it means a remnant will return. Strange name, isn't it? A remnant will return. And Assyria will come in and chop down Israel. But in chapter 7, verse 14, it says another child will come. Here it is. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Now, a, a virgin giving birth, God in this little baby, if you don't believe in predictive prophecy, they would have had to thought, well, this is Ahaz's son. It's going to be Hezekiah. But we know Hezekiah, is, he's a good man. He's a good king. But in chapters 38, 39, he's just mortal. He dies. He's fallible. It's not him. Who is this child? And then it says at the end of chapter 8, look at what it says in verse 22. And they will look to the earth, and, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish. And they will be thrust into thick darkness. God's people, Israel, will be thrust. They plunge themselves into darkness, by the way. 
Because it says in verse 21, they've cursed their king and cursed their God. Now we come to chapter nine, verse one. It all turns. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. Now this is important to understand. Isaiah projects Israel's tragic present into an already past. Okay, so now he's offering vision from the future. In the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea. This really is the promised land. The land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. So here he's saying, the land, you need to know this, the land of, Ze, uh, of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those are the first two of the 12 tribes. It was a northeastern part of the promised land, which then later during Jesus' time, we know is Galilee. This is where the ministry of Jesus would begin. The expansion of God's kingdom begins in this place. Look, don't miss this. The very place of God's judgment, the stump that is cut down, destroyed, and smoldering is the exact spot where the seed takes place and the ministry of God comes. The light comes in Christ who's the light of the world. Right in this same place. Look at verse two. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Look at this. The people are plunged into darkness. A seed comes forth, bringing light to the world. Friends, don't miss this. Even in your own life, what is it you're struggling with right now? Maybe you need that. What are you waiting on? Or what is it that really has you anxious today? Some of us are going through some very difficult seasons right now. I spoke to one of our members whose father is in the hospital, gave them a call yesterday because many of us are struggling. Many of us are walking through very difficult times relationally. What is it that your thinking just might do you in? Maybe it's because of your own sin. Our sin, we end up smoldering, cut down. What is it for you? For some of us, you need to hear this today. What you thought was going to kill you is actually where God is doing a new thing. What you thought would be the worst moment of your life, God is actually turning around. Or you thought you were cut down, being burned uh, by, the, by your own sin or by, by the sins of others. God is bringing his seed and hope and life and light to that very place because that's what he does. This simply becomes the macrocosm of his work across the universe as we wait for new creation to come, moaning and groaning within us. We know it's happening, but it becomes the microcosm of our lives. He turns our greatest tragedies into his greatest miracle. He turns even our failures into his new work so that we would glorify him with obedience. Only God can do this. It says that in verse three, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. The rejo they rejoice before you as with joy at harvest, which is a big deal back then with the great harvest. As they are glad when they divide the spoil, he's gonna repopulate the people. God's people are shut down. They're gonna enter into exile. God's gonna repopulate his people. And now the new Israel the church is born over time as Christ comes. But here we see, can I even say it? Joy to the world is what he's proclaiming. The joy that comes with great celebration. Greetings to all. Can I say it again? Goodwill towards all men. Sounds like the proclamation of the angels in Bethlehem. Look at verse four. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. This light is gonna come. This king is gonna come and destroy all the oppressors, all the tyrants, all of the injustice in the world. He's gonna bring justice. All abuse will end, will be destroyed and burned up. But how is this gonna happen? Who is this coming king? Look at verse six. For to us, your translation, unto us, for us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All this because a child 
is born. What kind of king is this? What kind of kingdom is this? And look what it said for us, for us. He'll take over the running of the world. He's an amazing counselor. He he brings miraculous wisdom. He is God, it says. And he's a father king. How about that? He's not just king. He's your father. Who is this king? Look at verse seven. uh, Of the increase of his government and of his peace, there'll be no end. It's ever expanding. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. His ruling authority will grow and grow. And there'll be no limits to the wholeness that he brings. Now we look around in our world today and we think this, okay, Christ has come. If he's the king, this does not seem to be happening. Now clearly Isaiah is telling us, yes, the Savior's coming. The king is Jesus, as we'll see very clearly here. There's no limit to what he will do. And the expansion of his kingdom will take place through his people and it will continue on. And it says, here and now, in time forth and forevermore. Isaiah is even pointing to new creation that is to come. We stand in the in-between. But the very location of the presence of God is in this king, he says. Formerly in the garden, Then he would come in the temple, his location of his presence in the temple. Then Christ comes, tabernacles among us, the very presence of God in the person of Jesus. He then promises the spirit to come. The spirit now comes in Acts 2. It comes to everyone who receives his his grace. The spirit of God, the very location of the presence of God is now in his people. And now we go as light into the world. Now that we have exegeted this passage, how do we wait? Let's talk about it as we close our time. We, we wait patiently. We wait purposefully. We, we wait peacefully. All right, first, patiently. Now, the spirit in us, yes, groaning within us for new creation, we wait. What does it mean to wait? Well, you we know how not to wait. Adam and Eve didn't wait, right? Uh, again, we noted Moses didn't wait. I mean, he's killing Egypt, an Egyptian while he's waiting for rescue. Even before that, Jacob didn't wait on the blessing. Throughout Israel's history, they wanted a king. Perhaps you know this. They wanted their own king. They didn't wait on the king. So Saul becomes king. He's half-hearted at best. David becomes king. Again, he's a type, but he's a broken man. And in a generation, Solomon, with all of his wisdom, ends up with a divided kingdom. And here we are. Evidently, our hope is not found in political leaders. Have we figured this out yet? Evidently, our hope is found in something beyond all men and all that we can see. When we don't wait, our impatient hurts not only us, but others. We we push our agenda. We want to move ahead. We force people into our plans. And be careful. It's the... Dreaded holiday projections, perhaps, around the dinner table. When are you going to... When are you going to grow up? When, when are you, you going to finish that degree? When are you going to get married? When, when are you all going to have... When are you going to have children? We force our agenda on others and in so doing, with simple words, we hurt others. Instead, we, we wait for God to move. We, we, we extend grace to one another. We, 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 we wait for that perfect job, perhaps, but in our waiting, somebody needs to hear this, be faithful right where you are. That's how you wait. What are you waiting for? How are you waiting for God to move? Because here's the challenge I want to bring to you. It may sound strange at first. I want you, we got about 30 days left in the year. A little bit more. My dad used to say on, on New Year's Eve, he'd say, if you want to get it done this year, you better get after it. <laughs> right? If you want to get it done this year, you, you need to get on it. Here's what I want to challenge you with. Hurry up and wait on the Lord. 
how do you do this? I'll tell you how I'm doing it in these days. The Lord has been teaching me in these days and I'm gonna do it throughout the Advent season. I'm gonna sit in his presence. I'm gonna sit quietly. That's kind of weird. No, no, no. Be still and know that I'm God. Sit in his presence. Well, what do I do? Do I, do I, do I hum? Do I, do I, no, no. The spirit of God speaks to us. If we listen, here's an acting I've found to be true in my life. When I'm busy, when I'm going from one thing to the next, I don't hear so much from God until he screams at me to slow down because I've worn myself out. Here's what happens. When I stop and listen, he speaks. He promises that he will. And this is why this is so important. You may not be in a pattern. I'm challenging you to get out of your regular rhythm And instead of getting up, checking your phone, reading the paper, getting anxious about all things going on in the world that you cannot control, instead to spend time before God in silence. Lord, speak to me. Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. I'm just going to sit in that. I want to encourage us all to do so. We wait patiently, but we wait purposefully. We, we have a purpose. You look back at the king and how he's come to bring his kingdom. Jesus didn't simply come to prove that he was God. He came as God to rescue us from our sin. And he's called us now to go and to share the news, to reach others with this gospel. It's simply put, we make disciples. We wait patiently. We wait purposefully. We wait peacefully. The Prince of Peace has come. I discovered this week, I didn't know this, but on on the United Nations building in New York City, I've been there, but I didn't know that there's this verse outside on the wall. And it's it's Isaiah chapter two, verse four. And it says this, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. You know this passage, perhaps. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Placed on the building, 1948, when it was built. We still haven't been able to come together to stop wars. And here's what I notice about that verse. That's not the whole verse. They, they cut off the first part of the verse. I mean, you read it that way, it's like, they, they will do this, they'll fix this. These people will fix, they, all these leaders will do this. The scripture says, he shall judge between the nations. This king will be the one and shall decide disputes for many peoples. God will do this. The coming Messiah will do this and he'll begin in each of our hearts. He is Jesus, the peacemaker between us and God. This is why we say, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait on the Lord because he will come through for you. This is the challenge for us today. And here, I want you to hear this as I close. The thing that you're waiting for is not the thing. What is the waiting for? The waiting is so that you would turn to him and find out that the very thing, the only thing that will satisfy your heart has already been provided. It's the king himself. He has already come to rescue you from your sin. John 1, 5, it says, in him was life. And the life was the light. Echoing back to Isaiah's words, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Friends, Christ has come. John says that we are eyewitnesses to this. We've seen him, we've touched him, we've heard from him, we we know him. And he goes on and on, he's so emphatic. Why is he so emphatic? When he says, we've seen him. We've touched him. He's just not, he's not making just conversations. One commentator said, the variety of verbs correspond to the variety of witness attestations in ancient jurisprudence. He's not just stating facts per se. Instead, he is swearing a deposition. He's testifying to the fact that the word became flesh. As we sing in one of our favorite carols, John Wesley says, veiled in flesh, the Godhead we see. Hail the incarnate deity. Friends, he has come and all that's left is for us to respond. 
And so what I want us to do, I want you to just close your eyes, bow your head right now. What are you waiting for? Can I say it? Maybe God is waiting on you to give your life to him right now. I want you to pray. What is he saying to you today? Give him your heart. Confess your sins to him. He's faithful and just to forgive you. He has made a way for you. The promise has already been fulfilled and will be fulfilled in your heart as you give your life to him. Commit today. Let us talk with you. Even today, receive Christ as your Lord. Determine to be baptized like those who've given witness today. Join the church. Finally, join the fellowship of God's people And as we wait, friend, listen, wait patiently, wait purposefully, wait peacefully. And remember this, in Christ, the best is yet to come. In him, in him, the best is always yet to come. We give you our lives, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.